Good evening to you. My name is Ibrahim Saleh. I'm a neurosurgeon and we are transmitting live from Amman Farah Medical Campus. And the backdrop is a slideshow in one of the villages in Jordan. So it's a window opening in one of the villages <coughs> in Jordan. The topic for today is IgG4 related hypertrophic pachymeningitis. We look into the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological correlation. So what is IgG4 related disease? In 2003, in the Journal of Gut, this uh, gentleman, Kamisawa from Japan, drew the relationship of pancreatic lesion with autoimmune disease and fibrosclerosis. So since then, we started to hear about IgG G4 related disease. It was reported first in the pancreas, then since then it was reported in nearly every organ. It affects multi-systems, it has a progressive course, and funny enough, 80% of the patients came from Japan. I will ask Dr. Hassan Adda, rheumatologist, to tell you about the general outline of this disease. <laughs> Dr. Ibrahim Talab, a few, few slides. This is a huge subject, but I try to summarize it. The definition is a chronic inflammatory condition characterized by tissue infiltration with lymphocytes and IgG secreting plasma cells with various degree of fibrosis. Which, may, which causes scarring and usually prompt response to steroids. It is an autoimmune, immune mediated condition, and as uh, Dr. Ibrahim mentioned, is, was recognized uh, as a systemic disease back in 2003. And the pancreas is the most commonly involved organ. Pituitary and meninges are the most commonly involved organ in the CMS. And as I said, there, there is a good and marked quick response to steroids. In incidence, Dr. Ibrahim mentioned, you know, mostly described from Japan, and, uh, the search through network of Japanese researchers, they, they research about uh, acute intermittent pancreatitis study. And they reported almost 8,000 patients throughout Japan. Yani the incidence is almost 0.97 per 100,000. Yani uh, 8,000 patients throughout Japan, they had IgG-related disease. 4,300 patients with IgG reported dacryoadenitis involving the eyes, and cyaloadenitis, and around 2,700 patients with type 2 acute intermittent pancreatitis. And the criteria for diagnosis, organ involvement, serum IgG4 level more than 135 milligram per deciliter, and the biopsy of the pathology, I'll not talk about the pathology, and it will be mentioned later. Uh, in animal organ involvement, almost every organ in the body was described. And I'll start with the lymph node, cervical lymph node, and uh, lymph nodes in the, in the chest, hilum and neck lymph node, the CNS meningitis, autoimmune adenohypophysitis, the whole pituitary, Michel's disease, bilateral parotid enlargement, Riddle's thyroiditis, thyroid gland, 
mediastinal fibrosis, prostatitis, serotumor of mammary gland, sclerosing, cholangitis, and hepatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, this is the commonest, and interstitial nephritis, and retro uh, fibrosis. Almost every, every organ was described um, for this disease. The pituitary, and I think Dr. Prime will talk about that, pituitary gland and the dura mater, CNS involvement usually, pituitary gland, either anterior or posterior, anterior, you know, headache, visual, visual field defect, and uh, lactation, like lactorrhea. The posterior will usually present with diabetes and sibilance, and the clinical manifestation depends on which hormone and is interrupted. Dura matter involves either intracranial meninges or intraspinal meninges. Treatment. Steroid is the first line treatment for this disease. Many cases require aggressive and immediate treatment depending on organ involvement to prevent organ dysfunction and, for, and failure. Lymph adenopathy may remain indolent and asymptomatic for many years and does not require treatment. Therefore, the treatment must be individualized for each patient. Its dose is usually 0.6 milligram per kg for two to four weeks and then taper over three to six months. And some patients may need steroid sparing agents like azathioprine, mycophenolate, and methotrexate. And those who fail, there are new studies about rituximab. Failure for, for, for this medication, rituximab is good. Again, yes, sir. Uh, prognosis the natural history is not well studied. A spontaneous improvement can be seen, but disease often recurs without the treatment. And most patients, as I mentioned, uh, respond uh, uh, fully to steroids. Relapses are common. Significant organ dysfunction may arise from uncontrolled and progressive inflammatory fibrotic changes. And there are few case reports of increased risk of malignancy, especially lymphoma. And this needs further study. Okay. Uh, one one minute, because uh, this patient presented with uh, uh, meningi battery meningitis. Rheumatological causes of battery meningitis. And uh, polyangitis with the granulomatosis have a Wagner. And the one first, let's just tell you his name. The man Wagner discovered that Nazi was with Nazi genes. So he was put on ACR or ULAR to change the name from Wagner. Uh, to previous name, polyangitis and the granulomatosis. So I will have to say that the rheumatoid is the, uh, the second cause. Few cases report about SLE and mixed connective tissue disease, and the last one is sarcoidosis. Thank you very much. Uh, so, it's a new disease discovered in the pancreas 2003, and then we are discovering it in various parts of the body. Usually it affects uh, old age. The youngest is 10, the oldest is something like 62. Male to female, unlucky for us, is eight to one. Uh, Mayo Clinic in 2015 put this diagnostic approach to the complexity of IgG4 related disease. And they say that at least two out of the three criteria to diagnose the disease. You have to have lymphoblastic infiltrates, lymphocytes, plasma cells. You have to have extensive fibrosis, and you have to have obliterative phlebitis. So three, two out of three. Lymphoid infiltrate, T cells and B cells, and these are the positivities. Plasma cells, both cava and lambda should be positive, and they need more than 10 plasma cells per power field to be positive for this disease. And increased IgG serum level, but that not necessary. And there is a ratio of IgG4 to IgG in general of 40%. Causes, as Dr. Mondaf mentioned, 
primary or idiopathic is 45 percent say 50 percent and the rest are 50 percent and the rest are either autoimmune or infection or sarcoidosis secondary to autoimmune disease as i said 35 percent could be secondary to infection that's 13 percent And infection like tuberculous hypertrophic pachymeningitis, you can see there in tuberculous infection. And this is the disease surrounding the dura. It could be secondary to infection of fungus. And this is a case report showing that. It could be secondary to sarcoidosis in 7% of cases. Look at this masses that look like meningiomas, but they are sarcoidosis and they love the pituitary, the stoke and the hypothalamus. Other causes in general, chronic exposure to antigen or pathogen or chronic tissue damage would cause this autoimmune disease. So SLE, systemic lobus erythematosus, with the so-called pseudotumor in the past is included. Giant cell arteritis, vasculitis, rheumatoid disease can be a cause for this. And this is a case report, giant cell arteritis associated with the spinal cord compression. And they ask, is there an overlap here? The answer is yes. And there was a case uh, of uh, thoracic spine in polymyalgia rheumatica. So that's how much it is associated with rheumatoid disease. Also, it could be secondary to trauma or hematoma, secondary to radiotherapy, mucopolysaccharidosis, and to those aren't. So is there a genetic predisposition since there's so much in the Most likely, population? absolutely. That one should one postulate, yes, true. Uh, this is a case of spinal pachymeningitis treated with mucopolysaccharidosis. So these are not fancy disease, these are not imaginary diseases, these are true diseases. But we as physicians, we've lost the connection. We have this narrow vision of looking into things in a very superficial way. Medicine is very deep. And this case of <coughs> hypertrophic pachymeningitis associated with heavy chain disease, uh, uh, hematological disease. Most organs, many organs, but mainly pancreas, bile ducts, and lungs. And this is the case of autoimmune pancreatitis. You can see the pancreas very taken. This is histologically proven. Again, these are not fancy diseases. These are patients with this kind of uh, affection. Aortic dissection. Chest involvement. Michelix disease. Association of dacroidinitis with parotitis and subendubular and pancreatitis or mycolix. Riddle's thyroiditis. And again, you can see that this is an autoimmune disease, Hashimoto disease, too. So, we've mentioned what is IgGG4 disease, which is the, the address. But then we come to the uh, case. It is IgGG4 that affects the CNS. And we call it sclerosing hypertrophic pachy meningitis. Why pachy? Pachy means thick, and thick means dura. So that's why it's called pachy meningitis. It is not a true meningitis, it looks like meningitis. So that's the terminology. Pachy is the thick dura that has affection like inflammation, and there is a lot of fibrosis, so it is sclerosing hypertrophic. Could be focal or diffuse. And it affects here the brain more than it affects the spine. So most of the cases are cranial, few are cervical. Can affect the orbit, that's called pseudotube. Look at here the normal side, and this is the affected side. Look at the dura, and red, look at the dura here, it's very thick. So you have to look carefully to see what's the origin of the disease. This is the dura normal, and this is very fibrotic uh, meninges. And in the cranial, it can affect anywhere, cavernous sinus, optic canal, orbital fissure, tentorium, and so on. 
Centurium, Centurium, both Petrus Regis and Quermasinus, Fox and Centurium, and so on. Here is the Cavernous Sinus bilaterally. So you have to be careful in diagnosing these cases. These, some of these cases were treated with gamma. Again, you have to question this in a very big way because um, gamma knife is usually run by uh, mediocre neurosurgeons. And in 2012, there is this uh, case uh, of uh, multiple lesions like this, hypertrophic pachymangitis. As you look in the cranium, if you look in the spine, again, you have to look at the dura, you have to look at the subarachnoid space. Of course, here is the uh, posterior retinal ligament, here this is ligamentum flavum. So all these will be thickened. So when you look at an X-ray or MRI, you have to look where the disease starts. Look at this. The whole thing is surrounding the cord. The whole thing, the whole dura and ligaments are surrounding the dura. Here it is at the foramen magnum, the thoracic spine, cervical spine, and so on. Again, here, look at this. You may think this is an intramedullary tumor, and it can go through the foramen. You can think of it as, as a schwannoma. And if you do PET scan, it is hypermetabolic. Another PET scan, you can see that it is hypermetabolic. So PET scan can be useful. Same thing, and in here. How many cases reported in the spine? You may not believe it, but the cases since 2009 to 2018 are only 16 cases. Our case is number 17. So it's a very rare case, and we have already written it, and we are submitting it for publication. These are the cases starting 2009, 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, and a case that was published 2018 of spinal hypertrophic back hemorrhagitis. So it is a real disease. But the, why are we, are we presenting this rare disease? Because we have to know it. Because we will not diagnose right and will not treat right if we don't know it. What's the treatment? As Dr. mentioned in the treatment, Dr. Ladaf, uh, the main treatment if you have a cord compression is surgical. You have to uh, take off the compression on the cord by either doing laminectomy or laminoplasty. I believe in laminectomy more than I believe in laminoplasty. I've tried both. I did not find any advantage of this. It's just extra time. Uh, if you stop where you stop, then there is no uh, involvement of the stability. So you are going for the maximal excision of the thickened dura. You cannot remove all the dura because it is surrounding the whole cord. You may go for CT guided biopsy, which is not likable for finding it. Yes, and we will see this in, in our film. The question was, do we actually do duoblasty? The answer is yes. Steroid treatment, that's usually after surgery, right? But you may give it as a sole treatment without surgery if there is no major cord compression or if the patient is unfit for surgery. But this is usually after surgery. Ridnizolone or dexamethasone, six weeks to 15 months. Ridnizolone, pulse therapy, a one gram IV three days and then you taper it off gradually. And then recently there has been a use of the immunosuppressants as a therabrine, methobrine and cyclophosphamide and so on. These are difficult cases. And how quickly do steroids work generally? Uh, Within, within, within days. And uh, as you know, steroids are the magic of the drugs, so people would say that's good. In neurology, is it classified that, that uh, dexamethasone dependent or dexamethasone dependent? So this is one of the paper of <laughs> as a firebrain. Uh, but remember, there is a relapse. And here is steroid resistant relapsing that was treated with methotrexate. So surgery, steroids, if they relapse, if they are resistant, 
to use methotrexate. And another case of another uh, neurosuppressant or neuromodification. And you can see that's after surgery, after the steroids, and then they give the immunosuppressant. And the last, not least, is the anti tuberculosis drug that are used for treatment of these cases. So, recurrence is very high, 33 to 50%. And it happens in surgical treatment. Surgical treatment, steroids, they can be care in 50% of patients and they come in years later. So I have to follow your patient for life. And this is recurrence after surgery and the steroids. Published 2004. So now we're coming to our case, IgGG4 related disease, and it is in the spine, hypertrophic pachymeningitis. So we know what does that mean, and we know what does that mean. This is a 27-year-old patient from Jordan who was in Saudi Arabia, and that's back in 2011. He complained from backache for years, and backache is, is a dilemma. Uh, the way people think about it, either you have a disc or you don't have. It's not like that. 5% are due to tumors, and maybe 80% are due to mal maluse of your back, you know, wrong postures and so on. So this unfortunate man has been complaining of backache for many years and nobody bothered to diagnose the case. Either you have or you don't have to disc, it's not like that. And then for nine months before the presentation, he became weaker in his legs with numbness and he had free controls. Young man having free controls, nothing in his past history, Nothing is general examination. Vital signs were normal. Upper functions were normal. Cerebellar signs, he had imbalance in gait. Now, is this a true cerebellar sign or is it due to the weakness and the loss of joint position since in his lower limbs? And rhombergism was positive, though I doubt that because I believe strongly that rhombergism is only positive if you have syphilis, tapis dorsalis. If you don't, usually it is not positive. Uh, again, you stand the patient and ask him to close the eye and do the like this, you say it's positive. It's not. Positive that he collapses suddenly to the floor in tapis dorsalis, which does not exist anymore. Pulmonology, there was nothing there. He was intact. In his upper limbs, he was okay. In his lower limbs, three over five. And there is loss of joint position sense. If you lose your joint position sense, you will trip on anything on the floor. Hatalo can, what can breathe, it can cause you to fall. And he had brisk reflexes, both sides. And he had upward going plantar response, or Babinski. We stop saying positive or negative. We say Babinski up means it is positive. And he had, unsus he had sustained clonus tuck, 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 in his ankles and knees. Not only that, but he had sensor level at about thoracic five. Nipple is thoracic five, umbilicus is thoracic 10. So he had this level of sensory. Everything below that has been decreased or lost. Pain, prick, temperature, and touch. And to know that, you have to know the kind of presentation that you have in terms of weakness or sensory changes. This is usually peripheral in your itis. This is sensory that we describe. And then we have the so-called dissociated sensory loss. And also you have to know the anatomy of the spinal cord, the joint position sense, uh, gracile and kinate and the corticospinal tract and the spinothalamic tract, where they are and how they are presenting and the joint position sense they are presenting the sacrum is inside here, the sacrum is outside. So all this should be in your mind. I ask myself how many neurosurgical residents sitting for the exam know anything about this? Because they are not asked. They ask about, oh, you have a case of glioma, how you treat it? Oh, the surgery, the oh. Like, <coughs> yeah, hematology. For well, this patient was okay, in the function, Little functions were okay, and images. This is the image 
this is the Cervanca. You see something is here. You can see the T1. T2, you see a Cilinx inside the code. And again, you see something there. Cilinx inside the code, which is not continuous, but it is there and there. And we have to differentiate between a Cilinx and hydromyelia. Hydromyelia is the dilatation of the central canal. Syrinx is a syrinx inside the cord, not related or maybe related to the central canal. So here you are, the cord and the syrinx. It happened to be in the midline. And here is the contrast. You can see tube there. That's extending extensively in the lower thoracic and level, in the, the lower cervical and upper thoracic. Look at this here. And if you look at the cuts, this is without contrast, and this is with contrast. So maybe this is the dura, and this tumor is going this way and also going this way. It starts from here, from the lamina. So it must have involved the, uh, uh, the ligament, ligament and flower, and the dura, and it went into intradurally. Very funny appearance, but very peculiar. Look at this. All this is the region. And it is surrounding the dura. So you cannot excise it completely. You have to go for maximums. Look at here. Let's go into the foramen. It can go to the vertebral artery. It can go to the lumbar area, etc. This is the rest of the thoracic. And this is the lumbar. So you have to do total spine MRI. And if you think of this pachymeningitis, you have to do brain MRI. At that stage, when we saw him, we did not think of, uh, of bacteria meningitis, so we did not do the brain MRI. So what's the differential diagnosis? Frightening. You have to differentiate from the intra-dural, intra-medullary tubes. So this is a normal, anterior horns, posterior horns, Astrocytoma usually is off midline. The dermoma usually in the midline. Cavernous and germa can be anywhere, but they like the anterior parts. Lipoma, they like the anterior parts. Intramedullary schwannoma are rare, but they can present like intramedullary lesion. Mangioblastoma, they have small medule and assist. And of course, metastasis could be anywhere. If you look at the MRI, these are the differential diagnoses that you have. And you have to make a plan to treat this. Vindemoma, one of my cases, NF2 patient with intramedullary astrocytoma. There it is. It looks like our case. Astrocytoma, very much like our case. Cavernoma, a lady from Jordan, a lady that comes from Dubai every now and then, and the end she had this cavernoma. Emangioblastoma, unfortunately, with these small lesions that have been following up, developing into these. Intramedullary schwannoma, which is very rare in this young man, 28-year-old uh, from Jordan with this lesion. Again, it could be hypertrophic meningitis, becky meningitis. We did the surgery for him, and this is the histology. It was intramedullary schwannoma. Spinal epidermoid. Looks like our case, this is after surgery. This is the operative finding. And this is a very, very case, a very unusual case. This is called concentric meningioma. Look at this. This is the code, and all this is the meningioma. And she came with, uh, from Libya with the uh, almost hemiplegia. Look at this. We did the surgery for her. Another case of meningioma, as you said, pachy meningitis hypertrophic can may present like uh, discrete lumps. Tuberculoma, and this is 30, no, 43 year old uh, doctor in Jordan who presents to me with this lesion. No history of TB whatsoever. Look at this. And it was a tuberculoma without any primary TB. Dumbbell neurofibroma, like our case. So we consented the patient to have surgery, but should 
But we did not know the diagnosis. For me, this is a spinal cord compression and I need to decompress. I did not have a clue what that is. So uh, the, the width of the differential diagnosis is really frightening because we know the topic of this discussion, but you get these, these are difficult cases to operate upon anyhow, the tough cases to operate upon anyhow. Um, and it's very tempting to brush this aside and send to radiotherapy with no tissue diagnosis, with disastrous consequences. Ependymoma's treatment after optimal surgical decision, uh, excision, um, and after radiotherapy, which will gravitate towards craniospinal radiation, uh, they will get uh, platinum-based uh, chemotherapy after that. Meningiomas, the extent of surgery is really, uh, is really important. Astrocytomas, uh, after surgery, radiotherapy would be really pivotal in that. I can't emphasize enough the importance of not missing something as mundane, quote unquote, as tuberculoma. Where radiating this would pay, basically the patient would have died for something he could have been treated with by pills. It's as simple as that. And we are living in an endemic country for TB, something that is frequently forgotten because some people have under, are under the impression that we're in Switzerland. We are still endemic in TV, for TB, right, Dr. Montessor? Yes. Am I mistaken in making that horrendous statement? There's plenty of TB going around. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of these cases, we keep hammering this on a, on a weekly basis. A lot of these patients are sent for radiotherapy or steroids that would basically melt this down, and God knows what would that be later on. And when they relapse, they relapse with vengeance and die. I know cases of disc prolapse treated by orthopedic or spinal or even GP with just the steroids, which is crazy. Please. Just for our colleagues, are we a radiologist able to diagnose it? No. I can't differentiate it from lymphoma. Oh, no. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. True. Imaging, maybe what is you see that it is in T1 and T2, it is hypo, which is let you think about there is some fibrous tissue. The enhancement usually delayed, so you should take delayed acquisition for enhancement. But as radiologists, we can differentiate between the uh, IgG related <coughs> disease and the others. By lab, you can't rely on lab. As Dr. Brahim said, IgG4 in the plasma can be positive or negative. It is around, I, I remember, 25% of the IgG4 is negative in the plasma, and in the patient with sarcoidosis and al some allergies, they can have positive IgG4 in the plasma. So neither lab, neither radiology can give you the clue that this is the diagnosis, and mostly you have to go for biopsy. Thank you. So it is a diagnosis by exclusion, as you just handsomely explained. Sorry? IgG subclasses for IgG subclasses. Yes, of course. Yes, we'll come to that. But what I meant, what I meant to say is that at the time of surgery, I did not have a clue what the diagnosis yeah. is. For me, this is a young man with paraplegia and sensory level that I want to save, no matter what. <clears throat> and of course, the complication here is twenty percent that can have bleeding, infection, total paralysis. Some anatomy, just to remind you of the blood supply of the cord, and why did we have a syrinx in the first place in this patient? The syrinx is above the compression, because blood supply of the spinal cord is very tenacious, very little. It comes from the radicular arteries, with the cervical and the vertebral artery, interspinal, spinal, or from the arch of aorta or the intercostal arteries, or with the lumbar arteries. So these go into the foramen, and they made a plexus around the uh, cord, like this. So there's a plexus of vessels around, and this plexus of vessels give straight arteries. So this area is the watershed area. It is the least supplied with blood. So any compression on the cord will cause ischemia, and ischemia will cause the syrinx. Uh, Dr. Mawia, would you like to comment? Uh, the surgery started at started the uh, knife to skin at almost 1015 
and we finished the surgery at 20, so it took 10 hours. Thanks very much, Mr. Brahim. I just uh, you are doing an amazing job, such a worth of uh, knowledge of your time. And uh, every Wednesday, I feel you know, actually more and more and more. Than, uh, I thought uh, last time we had, uh, not last, just last time, last two times we had a bit of uh, confusion about uh, American society of, of anesthesiology classifications. So I thought I will, I will go through with, uh, with you about the ASA classification, just a few slides, hopefully to clarify things. And if there is still things are not clear, please do ask. <laughs> Uh, as, as I said uh, last time, we are trying to find a process where to group all patients for risk stratification to do surgery and anesthesia. So I'm going to shed some lines in definition, history, importance, example, and to conclude uh, very quickly. And as I, as I said last time, uh, in this uh, hall, we've got all kinds of doctors, rheumatologists, hematologists, uh, neurosurgeon, physician, nephrologist, radiologist. So we are talking about a big group of patients with all kinds of diseases. We want to classify them in a very simple manner, in a simple way, to give us a hint what to do with these patients. And the purpose of this is it was to simplify and assess physical status of the patient prior to surgery. And uh, it has been used for record keeping. It is mandatory by JCI. Any hospital uh, has to apply for JCI, has to have all his patients classified by ASA classifications. It is good to communicate between colleagues if you want to transfer a patient to tell him he's ASA, there's a, high, a huge difference between ASA1 and ASA4 or ASA3. Uh, it has been used in the Western world for billing. Oh, and I'm, I'm sure sooner or later it's going to come to this country when you, by the way, uh, ASA classification موجود بال billing which has been used, no, anesthetizing ASA1 is not the same as anesthetizing or operating in ASA3. So sooner or later, and it is a uniform system for statistical analysis. For us, if we want to do research in patients, what we do with this with this patient, how much does it survive, we need it. And last classification or last update in ASA came in, uh, in 2012, which uh, we've mentioned earlier, ASA1, just normal healthy patient, ASA2, uh, a patient with mild systemic diseases, which we, we, we mentioned does not affect his daily activity at all. ASA, ASA 3, a patient with severe systemic disease, for a patient with severe systemic disease that is constant threat to life. Five, a morbid patient who is, not, uh, who is not expected to survive without the operation. And six, declared brain dead for organ donation. By the way, five and six have been added in the, in the early 90s. Originally, it was only four classes. Lanosarfi and the organ donation and etc. So just a few words on history. When they were started, three anesthesiologists have met in 1941. And they want a score for the patient to, well, to, to do what we mentioned earlier. And the first attempt was to certify risk for patient, but was determined that that could not be done at all because you're talking about large group of patients with all kinds of uh, things. 1963, a drip system was developed, and that was the nucleus base of the ASA. By 1983, as I said, uh, five and six were added, and we, we end up with six classes. Uh, emergency was added, as I mentioned last time, ASA1E or ASA2E, because the E traced the M&M &M, uh, on the patient. And uh, the, the problem with ASA is still as I said, it, it can be manipulated. Or the criteria for the day unit surgery in, in the States, you have to have you have to be ASA one or two. Sometimes a small operation like cystoscopy, ASA3, they might accept it. So it is sometimes manipulated by billing insurance company or by doctors. Insurance is hella rahijo and no he's ASA3, he's not going to be insured, we're going we are not going to pay for him and etc. Uh, as I said, it, it is important for us, and it will stay important. It's simple, but we can't have better. It's very important for billing. It is coming in Jordan. Base value of the patient. 
pre-procedure code, which follows diagnosis code and statistics and relating hospital rankings for post-operative outcomes. Uh, we can we can see what they do hospitals with they say three patient mortality for example in this hospital comparing with x hospital with y hospital and, to, and guideline provide to create standard of care of patients they come in so it has a very high potential for inaccuracy because precision and inconsistency as i said because it can be manipulated so it is not 100 percent proof and good for statistics but nonetheless is there and going to stay there cleveland have uh, but done a study in, uh, about ASAs between 1994 to 2012. And respondents, there were 24 senior anesthetists, 35 anesthetists residents, nurse anesthetists, 37 surgery senior staff, 32 surgery residents, and one post op nurse. And what they thought from this finding was 95%, almost 96% respond that they were familiar with ASA, which is very good. And I think all accredited hospitals at the moment, all of them are familiar with ASA. As I said, because it's a criteria, it's a demand by JCI, so you should be familiar with it. Only 10% stated that they gave higher ASA score than their peers, which is, I, I'm surprised, totally. 82% said they followed specific guidelines, ASA or Cleveland Clinic. We need guidelines. 90% believe anesthesia senior staff were responsible for the ASA, which is true, and only 59% believe that the ASA was very important. Though it is extremely important, as, as I said, this, this is uh, uh, JCI. This this is risk, which is stated by JCI, which is uh, the the insurance company. If, if you are uh, labeled as ASA one, your mortality morbidity will be anywhere between zero six to zero eight percent. ASA two 20, zero point two seven to zero four, which is double. ASA three one point eight to four point three. It's a large variation. Three between seven or eight. Point, uh, to 7.8 to 23, SA49.4 to 50 percent. So you could see a very large variation. In, but this is this is this is which accepted by JCI certification. Uh, it's still, it's not complete because I just bought a couple of examples. I'll finish. This is, for example, 56 year old male with history of uh, well controlled hypertension, present for elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and he has been given to many institutes to class him prior to surgery. SA1 only has been put by 0.6% of anesthesiologists, 90% they put them ASA2, and 3%, sorry, 8%, 9% they put them even ASA3. So it still is manipulated and is not very good or not very well established between us. Same with this for C-section. For us, C-section, this is only 24-year-old for presenting normally health, healthy should be ASA1 has been only 30% classified 30, uh, ASA1, 50% ASA2, 13% even ASA3, even ASA5, which is not expected to live without the, the surgery. So this is between anesthesiologists. As, uh, as in the, uh, if you look at this spinal stenosis, an infant, this is the most, this is really nightmare, for, even for me, to, well, I can't classify him well. And you could see the variation, even at six brain dead. Some anesthesiologists put him in ASA6. And uh, this is true cases which have been uh, published. Now, anesthesia related mortality to the, what happened? Anesthesia related mortality, uh, when, when anesthesia was invented in 1940s, was one in a thousand. By 1970s, it turned out to be one in 10,000. Then, 90s and 20s, <coughs> one in 100,000. Today, luckily, it's one in 400,000. So, it's quite safe, it's quite good. We put all clean drugs, monitors, training. So this is morbidity and mortality only due to anesthesia, nothing else. So one in 400, almost one in, in, in a half a million. So to conclude, ASA physical sciences went through several changes throughout its development. It's quite important and it's coming in Jordan for billing, statistics, hospital ranking, post-operative outcome. And I think really we should look for hospital ranking to see what they do with ASA 3 and 4, what the, the survivor. And it's important to create consistency and standard for hospitals. And these, some more references if you want to go further. Thank you very much. So if you need an anesthesia, you know where to go. You will do two anesthesia for the price of one. Buy one, get one. So as I said, we stopped here at this anesthesia job, started 10, 15 in the morning, we finished 
10 o'clock in the evening. This is a very lengthy surgery. Should be the surgery. And you had him in a prone position? Yeah, a prone position, yes. So I'm opening, of course, I've done the laminectomy. Now I'm opening the supposedly the dura, <clears throat> which usually you just need to put the neck in it and then you open it. But look how thick it is, fleshy and vascular at the same time. And I have to open the whole length of the of the disease. It's about four or five levels. But look at this, it's vascular and it is very thick, fleshy, very fleshy. I did not know what I'm dealing with. Is this the cord thickened or is this the dura or what? So I have to take it slowly and easy. <clears throat> Here we started to find a little bit of plain cleavage with this fleshy mass and the arachnoid. Of course, this is a microscopic surgery. This is, we took it with a the, with the stitch. You can see the thickness of it. Very, very thick. Now, again, trying to open into the uh, subarachnoid space because that's the only way to recognize uh, that's it. That's the subarachnoid space. So we know now that we are coming to the subarachnoid space around the, the cord. Again, it is vascular. And we put this instrument, which is a uh, the sector, so that we separate this fleshy mass from the arachnoid. I use a knife to cut over it as a protection to the cord. Because already this cord is, is very much affected. Now, having opened it this way, so I go and remove this thickened the dura from the back of the dura. I will not go anterior to the dura or anterior to the cord. It's very thick, fleshy material. I take it on this side, and I go and take it on the other side. The cord is very tenacious in blood supply, and we need to preserve it. We're not looking for radiological success. We are looking for true clinical success. So look at it. Very thick and mass. And the cord was affected from from scheme, Pressure. from scheme, it's called combustion by scheme. And you can see some of these flakes, you see, call them corn flakes. They are not corn flakes, they are calcification within the arachnoid. And I will remove one for the camera later on. We do some theatrics in theater, just to... But you can see the thickness. And you remove them like, like these. أرش شو الأكل اللي هي فيها اللحمة هيك موجودة شو اسمها مروان يمكن تعرف أنت اللحمة هيك بتجى طويلة آه يعني شو زي هاي الكورن فليكس هاي الاندركل هاي الكورن فليكس اللي حكينا it's a flake of calcification in the subarachnoid space I think one of the resident was there with me said what's this I said I will take it for you we'll send it for analysis and you'll see that this is and just calcification in the uh, arachnoid. So we continue taking as much as we can of this, of this thickened dura, the fibrotic thick dura. So how many levels? Uh, uh, five levels. Because I have to do, this is uh, what Dr. Asar asked, do we uh, uh, stitching? Yes, high artificial dura, it is cadaveric dura, uh, it's very expensive, it is 1,800, this piece. And we switch it to the edges of the dura. So we have removed the posterior part of the dura, and now we are replacing it with this uh, wide uh, segment so that the cord can breathe and can have a space if compression would come back again. And we don't put the drain here, never, because once you open to this SF, you cannot put the drain, so it has to be absolutely spotless, no blood whatsoever. Again, this is done under the microscope. It cannot done by the naked eye, no way. 
even surgery for this should be microscopic. Hydrogen peroxide to make sure that there's no bleeding and to uh, show some oxygen which will uh, combat the anaerobic infection. So this is the the, out, the, the final. And then I put some uh, gel to compact the, uh, to achieve good hemostasis. Okay. So within hours, we put them in four minutes. So first off. <clears throat> this is a very interesting disease and very interesting entity. Uh, this is actually a newly described entity. I can't, not known before 2000. I think the, the first the liter literature collection was in 2003. And uh, we attended many conferences and many meetings talking about this disease. That is, it's a real disease that existing in 2003 uh, when I attended the US CAB in the United States. So when you attend a new entity and you know that you are going to face this entity, you're like you, you are waiting for your enemy. And the first uh, case that I have seen uh, of IgG4 related disease uh, was in 2005, probably two years after this uh, big uh, influx of cases. It was from the pancreas where the surgeon called me because he wants me to have a second look over his uh, opinion on uh, this, this tumor that uh, pathologist or uh, another pathologist called it lymphoma. So I looked at it and I told him this is a new entity called IgG4 related disease and he did not do the surgery and he, the patient responded dramatically to steroids. So uh, you have to be always updated on pathology and uh, uh, always waiting for the new cases. Especially this is not IgG4 related disease, not really a rare tumor. It is uh, not diagnosed before. Now we know a lot about it. We know why it's called IgG4. You can see this tumor has a heavy lymphoblasmocytic infiltration, but there's a lot of dysmoblastic or fibrous tissue. Uh, this inflammation is actually uh, 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 variable from one place to another place. And look at this area. It's mostly it's uh, uh, a lot of fibrous tissue in this area. There's uh, some inflammation here. Uh, this this is the inflammation. Uh, the inflammation has typical story form appearance. Can you cartwheel? Can you This is typical one feature. There are three typical features histology. You can you have to see histologically before you go into the immune. See the histology, cartwheel appearance, and then you say, see this is a blood vessel. It's uh, around the blood vessels is more, and this is what we call the uh, uh, phlebitis, uh, 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 concentric phlebitis. You have better cases. Uh, this is more of the uh, fibrous tissue uh, in this area, less cellular. Next slide. You can see this is a typical cartwheel appearance. You believe how about the fibrous tissue, and this is typical of this IgG4 related disease. Yeah, there is fibrosis, but you have to see the fibrosis in cartwheel appearance. This is important. One of the important. Histolog histological features. The second histological features, next slide, it's lymphoblasmocytic. You have to see lymphocytes and plasmacytes. And the plasmacytes is the core points of this uh, etiology of the disease. The plasma cells in this area, different from other plasma cells, they are not the usual plasma cell that secrete IgG1. IgG1 is the most common IgG that is present in uh, plasma cells. It's, uh, they are secreting IgG4. And uh, IgG4 has different mechanism of interaction with inflammation. They, have, they don't have the ability to uh, do the classical pathway of uh, complex uh, interaction. They do it through interleukins. And the interleukins, these are the, the ones that you, they do the inside the fibrosis. So that's why you see more fibrosis in IgG4 producing plasma cells rather than in the usual uh, uh, IgG1. Uh, uh, next slide. You can see how <clears throat> how the cartwheel appearance the react to surround the blood vessel uh, veins that's called phlebitis, concentric phlebitis. That's the third uh, feature, and it's variable from one side to another side. Uh, again, you can see how they surround the veins. We, I will show you more in the immuno and how variable is the inflammation from one side to the, another side. But you have to when you see something like that, 
يعني فرع بقول الجسم we always have to exclude this not lymphoma because lymphoma can have uh, fibrosis and sclerosis so you always have to be really sure that this is not a lymphoma this is a reactive inflammatory process because the treatment is too, too wide and too different in these two, uh, two occasions uh, again you can see how the blood vessel and these are surrounding the blood vessels but you still see how the inflammation they go in the cartwheel and kind of tracks around them and they go one by one like indian filing uh, one around the other one next slide here, here you can see the how the concentric around the blood <coughs> the veins typical this is the third feature that we look for in these cases uh, igg4 related diseases Again, you can see the lymphoblastmacytic infiltrate. Here, I did CD10. CD10 stains uh, the lymphoid cells, <coughs> but also it stains the, uh, the stromal cells. You can see the lymphoid cells, are, most of them are negative, but it's strong in the uh, stromal cells. This indicates that these cells are, uh, lymphoid cells are negative for CD10, because you have to exclude not to, to be positive. But you see how the, the stromal cells are abundant and uh, this is this case next slide cd34 stains the blood vessels and stain also some of the stromal cells but you can see how the blood vessels endothelial cells and this is the typical concentric phlebitis that we see in uh, uh, these cases cd20 was uh, batchy uh, most of these cells are not cd20 but cd20 this is the cd20 positive cells uh, and you remember plasma cells all, uh, although they are producing IgG, but they are CD20 negative. So you expect some of these, many of these are plasma cells, so they are, should be negative for CD20. They have another marker, next slide, which is CD138, and you can see abundant one CD38. One CD38 stands plasma cells. We can see how much of the infiltrate is plasma cells. All this brown material is plasma cells. So uh, there's a lot of plasma cells. This is one of the criteria, histological criteria, to call it that this is IgG4 related disease. Next slide. So then you have to have two important stains. You have to have IgG uh, uh, to prove that these plasma cells actually producing IgG, not IgM or IgA. And you can see there's abundance of IgG staining. IgG uh, uh, compromise all the four subclasses. We have four subclasses of IgG. IgG1, 2, 3, 4. IgG1 represents the most of the bulk of the IgGs. IgG4 is the least, is 3 to 6, 3 to 6 percent. Yeah, I mean, this is the least. But in these cases, next slide, IgG4 become more abundant, probably not as abundant as IgG1, but it's the one that incites the inflammation. You can see how many uh, positive IgG4 plasma cells. Uh, in literature about it varies what, uh, how much you consider it good for percentage. Some of them say 20 per high power field, some they go at 10 per high power field. But you have to have the ratio if there are more than 30 percent of the plasma cells. I think in this area was about 30 to 40 percent of the plasma cells were IgG4 positive. So this is uh, it was very good, and, and this is the only case that I had in the spine uh, called the uh, IgG4 sclerosing disease. But it has I think all the histological and immuno immuno uh, changes to call it IgG4. The patient actually came to me because Dr. Brahim Smeh told him about the disease. And I saw him, his gait is really, he's like, has stubborn gait when he walks in. Uh, he had, he was just after surgery. He wasn't really walking in comfortably, but I, I, I missed the follow up on this case. So I'm really interested to see how the patient responded to treatment. Thank you. I must say, when I sent the sent, uh, frozen section, and the answer came back, I don't know, I need more time. And I respect that. People don't give just an opinion and so on. Uh, Dr. Farsakh wanted more time to study the case, and he had that time. Uh, not only that, because the diagnosis later on came as unusual, so the family asked for a second opinion, and we had another second opinion from Maisa Hussaini, who confirmed the diagnosis. Not only that, Dr. Farsakh sent for his colleagues in Indiana University and they confirmed the diagnosis. So we have three different opinions confirming that. Again, I respect the second opinion. I respect people who respect the opinion of others. Uh, this is for you, Marwan. B-cells, positive. Plasmocytes, 
uh, Ki high IgG serum level. As I said, it could be normal, it could be abnormal, and uh, the immune stain which we had mentioned. Uh, serum protein electrophoresis, uh, different globulins and so on, and ratio. You want back? I just was wondering the, okay. the graph. The graph is almost never provided by lab. Right. And I, I continue to maintain, I need the graph. <laughs> sometimes you see a lot of I make it, I'll, I make a big fuss about this every single time okay. I see I send my patients back to the lab to bring me the graph. Every yeah. single time I get an estimate. It's and very important, I agree with you. It is, it's all yeah, about the graph. Course. Course. I agree totally. And they say they sent you the autograph. <laughs> uh, SR was elevated, 44, after one hour, I think it was 82 hours, CRP was elevated. And uh, so at Balbisi, we sent them to you, and we've done a few uh, investigations. Syphilis was negative, TB was negative, and you added uh, these uh, uh, tests, they were also negative. LE cells, ANA, and rheumatoid. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is doing nowadays. It is obsolete. I have one community in the report was uh, saying there is like I was saying there is something good. Uh, it's a, a diagnosis by exclusion, but this is not a diagnosis by exclusion. It's a diagnosis by inclusion. There is criteria, different criteria. So I don't know how can you tell that this is diagnosed by exclusion when we have different criteria. It's maybe not I, historical. I sure, please. Actually, you have to exclude other entities like uh, sarcoidosis, lymphomas, uh, rheumatoid disease, because IgG4 might be increased in those cases. Now, you have, if you find the granulomas with IgG4, I don't think, or, or what we call the secondary type, you shouldn't call it IgG4 related. You should call it the entity, Wagner's, for example. Yeah. But if you don't find, you find the by the histological criteria and IgG4 is percentage is high and you don't find the other features, then you will call it IgG4. So I agree to both. It is a disease of exclusion, as Dr. Hasbin Hadidi mentioned, that you cannot really pinpoint the diagnosis radiologically. But if you think about it, it's going to be inclusive. So which would bring my question, how can one be certain that this is not lymphoma with what we're seeing being secondary to lymphoma. And I'm just thinking aloud. I'm not saying I'm talking about this case, I'm talking about uh, the differential generally. And as I, you did mention several, several features. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a very good question. Although I really still think that it's a, a disease of inclusion, not exclusion. I have a, because I studied a lot about this disease. There are different criteria in all the literature. We said, what are the, the satisfactory things that you, when you call it, you are sure. Even if there, are, if, if there is no, if you do not study other things. I'm sure this is a disease of inclusion, not exclusion. <coughs> but lymphoma raises, raised actually when I saw the cases. I did, that's why I did CD20. CD20 was only a few positive cells. Uh, see, the, the, most of the lymphocytes <coughs> that are there, were CD138, which are uh, positive. So uh, you expect that every lymphoma usually is either CD20 or CD3. But because the lymphocytes were small or small lymphoblasmacytic, you know these are not CD3. So you know you are, you are talking about CD20 uh, uh, lineage uh, uh, diseases, which is come uh, the entity there. And CAB and lambda, we can, we, I think we did them in some areas, and the CAB and lambda did not show any preference. So uh, when you, do, you don't have monoclonality, and the cells, they don't look atypical, they are lymphoblasmacytic with the other histological criteria, with the increased uh, IgG4 uh, uh, presence, I think all this, they come together to exclude lymphoma. But uh, before you leave, is a podium, Dr. Sam. In the CNS, it's kind of, uh, Easier because uh, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, plasmoplastic lymphoma rarely involve the CNS in this manner. So, what, what if you're dealing with an extranodal site like the pancreas, which is the most common uh, site, uh, site of this? And the question is, how can one be certain this is not lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma or plasmoplastic lymphoma? I know that morphologically they would look different, 
But given the rarity of all of this, uh, how would you come? Again, we go back to morphology. I remember I have the three important histological criteria. Usually, lymphoblasmacytic lymphoma, they don't incite fibrosis in cartwheel appearance or storyform appearance. Usually, they are there, but there is not much fibrosis. And this fibrosis is due to interleukin uh, production. This is abnormal. These lymphomas, usually, when we saw them, they are sheath of cells. Uh, and this, not all the cases like this, but this is something that gives you the information. The second thing, you have to see the concentric around the blood vessels, especially around the blood vessels, you see these phlebitis uh, features. And this is very helpful when you see this. But and you have to put everything then in the context of the disease together. Yes. Can you see this concentric appearance in lymphomas generally? Mm -hmm. not, not usually, not usually. This well, is a fascinating case, I really Marwan. cannot emphasize this. Anything in the CSF? Did you do any, any work up for the IgG index? We didn't, but uh, I looked into the CSF findings. It's unreliable, and usually it's uh, at both ends of the spectrum in the cases reported. I was just wondering what kind of IgG index you see. Uh, as I said, there was nothing specific. That's why I just omitted. I, I may found it at the end of the lecture. I put them in the dump because I thought it did not do CSF, but I looked at the CSF in other papers. Uh, so we put him on steroids. We did the surgery, we did the decompression, so now to put him on steroids, he's 28 year old, and then he went back to Saudi Arabia on those of steroids. There he developed thirst and frequency of obturation, and he was diagnosed to have diabetes mellitus type 2. So, Dr. Juma? I've been wondering who was Mr. Dr. Guma, Dr. Juma. <laughs> From Pakistan. <laughs> uh, where is my slide? Uh, okay. Uh, really, I will uh, take you from rare uh, disease, uh, packing meningitis, to common disease, which is management of diabetes in hospital <coughs> setting. It is a very large topic. Uh, I will focus on a few things here. Uh, how, okay, I have a uh, wide uh, screen, therefore it doesn't fit exactly the scenes here. Okay. Uh, how common is hyperglycemia and diabetes in hospital? It is around 40% of all patients hospitalized, whether in ICU, whether in the world, in surgical or medical, 40% they are either with newly discovered diabetes, hyperglycemia, or frank diabetes will uh, establish. Uh, newly discovered hyperglycemia, it is associated with higher mortality than patients with well-known or previously diagnosed diabetes. Look at the mortality for a newly diagnosed hyperglycemia, it is around 16%, while patients with known diabetes, it is 3%, Without uh, diabetes, it is 17.7%. It is across a lot of medical entities. Uh, in newly discovered uh, hyperglycemia, it is associated with increased mortality and increased morbidity. It is here uh, patients with ischemic stroke, stroke. There is an increased length of stay in hospital mortality increase and 30 uh, day mortality increase. Patients with the pneumonia, Depends also the outcome upon uh, blood sugar, whether it is uh, below 200, above 200, it is, uh, whether it is mortality or hospital complication. Uh, the same thing applied for patients with myocardial infarction. Look here at the range of plasma glucose when it is going up, the mortality increase, if it, particularly if it is above 200. Uh, this is for uh, nosocomial infection in 100 uninfected diabetics undergoing elective surgery. The cut point here was blood sugar around 220, and there is an increase in infections, whether it is total infection or UTI infection. This is a patient uh, with, subjected to craniotomy. Very interesting, it is just two years. Uh, usually, we uh, use to increase infection in surgical patients, but here in neurosurgery also. And this is one paper here. Uh, they looked at intraoperative glucose level, and if intraoperative glucose level was above 180, 
the risk of uh, post-operative cranial uh, infection, it was almost four folds in comparison, and this is the most, uh, was significance when they did uh, regression analysis for all other parameters. The same another paper for patients with hyperglycemia outcome in surgical high-grade glioma patients. This is an abstract. I haven't full access to the uh, original article, uh, but the same here. Hyperglycemia is prevalent and multifactorial in post-operative glioma, and uh, blood sugar with uh, above 167 was increased with risk of serious complication and uh, increased risk of 30-day readmissions. <clears throat> Hyperglycemia is common uh, and it is associated with pro poor clinical outcome. Pathogenesis of hyperglycemia in hospital uh, patients, especially patients on steroids. Uh, you know that uh, a lot of patients who are uh, in hospital, they are giving IV fluids, particularly dextrose, and a lot of them, they are on steroids, and there is an increase of uh, contraint insulin hormones. It is hormones of stress, catecholamines, uh, growth hormone, cortisol. Uh, uh, all of these contraint insulin hormones lead to uh, either relative Okay. Mm. Uh, okay. Either lead to absolute or relative insulin deficiency and increase uh, counter regulatory hormones. And this lead all of them lead to increased lipolysis. And lipolysis increase uh, degradation of uh, fat to free fatty acids and the glycerol, which is a subject for increased gluconeogenesis in the liver. And the same applies, there is an increased protein breakdown and there is a lot of amino acids and lactate. All of these substrate for increased gluconeogenesis and increased glycogenolysis and increased glucose, uh, endogenous glucose production by the liver. All of these leads to hyperglycemia and hyperglycemia leads to volume depletion, hypoperfusion, electrolyte loss, acid-based disturbances. And tissue effect here uh, on the nitric oxide and platelet ac uh, activation, immune dysregulation, mitochondrial injury, which lead to a lot of uh, uh, complications. What about steroids? Uh, the mechanism behind steroids is the same. They increase uh, gluconeogenesis. They inhibit insulin release from the pancreas, and they decrease utilization of sugar by muscle tissue and by the fat tissue. <coughs> well. Does control of hyperglycemia matter? Uh, it is common, a lot of colleagues, it is a matter of a couple of days, the patient in hospital, he will be subjected to surgery, lest the resident puts him sliding scale and then we will send him to his doctor. It is common practice here, a few colleagues who are really consulting or bothering from hyperglycemia, despite it is uh, a serious and uh, as associated with a lot of mortality. Uh, I will bring just the three studies which show the importance of tight control of hyperglycemia during hospital. Here from Mayo Clinic, uh, they look uh, retrospectively at uh, uh, around 2,500 patients who were on two regimen, on sliding scale regimen and on continuous IV infu infusion for uh, cardiac surgery here. And uh, here, uh, Here was uh, a sliding scale regimen. Here, continuous insulin infusion. Uh, and uh, this is the rate of, sorry, this is the rate of uh, deep sternal wound infection uh, with the sliding scale regimen when they, uh, 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 it was gradually patients with diabetes and patients without diabetes. And uh, then, uh, this is this uh, non-diabetics here, diabetics here, mortality. Uh, in diabetics, uh, uh, mortality was higher, but when they implemented continuous insulin infusion and the mortality, it almost the same as patients without diabetes. And here, the mortality, a lot of figures according to cut point of glucose 
uh, below 200, above 200 on the first post-operative uh, glucose level. You see the length of stay, it was uh, double patients with the glucose above 200, the need for ventilation was triple, and the mortality was almost sevenfold. Uh, this is another trial from Belgium. It is Leuven uh, and critically ill patients, also cardiac, the, more, the majority cardiac subjected to uh, open heart surgery, 13% were diabetics. And they look at uh, tight control two groups, tight control diabetes with the range 80 to 110, another group from range 180 to 200 milligram. And uh, the mean glucose in the uh, Tight control was around 103 here, around 153. And uh, okay, here uh, the results of this uh, trial: there was 42% reduction in mortality with intensive treatment, and 34% reduction in mortality with intensive treatment here in hospital survival. Survival here in ICU. And uh, across the board, there was reduction in total mortality, blood infection, re acute renal failure, transfusion, polyneuropathy. Uh, another trial uh, in surgical world, they are not uh, cardiac surgery, it is uh, common uh, general surgery. They look at two regimen here, uh, patients with uh, sliding scale regimen here with basal bolus uh, regimen, and here the uh, it was the goal was achieved better with basal bolus regimen in comparison in comparison with sliding scale regimen, and there was uh, wound infection. The most important was significantly lower in patients with basal bolus regimen in comparison with sliding scale mm -hmm. regimen. Overall complications were significantly lower in patients with uh, basal bolus regimen. <clears throat> What about sliding scale viewers? Uh, you are waiting here, sliding scale, you are waiting when blood sugar is high, you give here insulin, it's going down, then uh, you are waiting until it's going up again and you give another shot of insulin. This approach, uh, uh, of course, this is uh, uh, you according to different criteria, how much the level of uh, sugar, how much you give dosages of regular insulin. But the caveat of this uh, uh, regimen, sliding scale, that numerous studies over the past 50 years show that sliding scale insulin alone is not effective for inpatient glycemic control, and more recently has been associated with increased inpatient mortality. Sliding scale insulin regimen do not allow for basal or mealtime insulin requirements and grossly underestimate total daily insulin requirements. Furthermore, sliding scale regimen respond to hyperglycemia after it had happened rather than preventing it. And you are waiting until sugar 300 for them, then you intervene and give insulin. The aim is to prevent hyperglycemia, not to treating it after it happened already. Sliding scale depends on the inaccurate assumption that insulin sensitivity is uniform to all pa in all patients. You are giving eight units when blood sugar, as example, 300. You are assuming that eight units will work in all patients. It doesn't work. There is a lot of factors other than that. Even in the same patient, from one day to another, the response is different. <clears throat> insulin sliding scale must be discouraged. This is the guidelines latest from American Diabetes Association about diabetes in hospital. I just uh, want to stress the goals here uh, of uh, blood sugar during hospital. It is uh, the ideal. It is from 110 to 140. But if you can achieve that level without hypoglycemia, if you cannot achieve level, that level with hypoglycemia, the aim is to be from 140 to 180 milligram deciliter. <clears throat> this is the uh, American Diabetes Guidelines. Look at here, recommendation, sole use of sliding scale insulin in the inpatient hospital setting is strongly discouraged. This is from just the last month, it is American Diabetes Association guidelines. Taban hypoglycemia should be documented, the treatment regimen <coughs> should be reviewed uh, and implemented 
This is regarding corticosteroids. Uh, patients on high-dose steroids, usually they do need basal bolus regimen from the beginning. Of course, uh, the calculation of dose, it depends upon body weight. Usually we start, if the patient is lean, we start with 0.7 units per kg. If the patient is obese and has insulin resistance from the beginning, I start with one uh, unit per kg and I intensify the regimen immediately within one, two days, I can achieve control. Uh, this is an example of our patient now in the hospital. Uh, she was admitted with mild diabetes, but she is obese and she is on dexamethasone 4x4. Four four, and she was on just oral hypoglycemic agents, Jargens SGL2 inhibitor. And I immediately put her on basal bolus glargin plus uh, novorapid. It is four injection daily, 50% of the dose it is basal insulin, and 50% of the dose it is divided in three meals for rapid acting insulin. And uh, I usually do uh, frequent blood monitoring, and I uh, ask the staff to inform me if any blood sugar above 100 or below 110 to inform me personally to, in to change regimen immediately. A lot of colleagues, they are putting the patient on sliding scale for two reasons. Either he doesn't know how to use insulin or he doesn't want to bother himself to receive a call from the staff of the hospital that sugar is uh, up or down. They're in the best and the easy scenario to put him on sliding scale. Even uh, some, unfortunately, some endocrinologists or internists, they do the same as residents do. They just put him on sliding scale. Uh, thank you very much. I think if the take home message tonight is just this sliding scale is to be sent to the rubbish, that's very good. Yeah, I had a comment. Uh, to your point, uh, Dr. Zuma, the international guidelines for surgical site prevention have included two points recently one, maintenance of perioperative uh, normal glycemia, and the other one is maintenance of perioperative hypo, I'm sorry, normothermia, uh, Dr. Maria maintenance of perioperative normothermia as ways of prevention of infection post op yeah. I just uh, I forget to mention, this is my input. This is, this is not from the guidelines, my experience. Uh, patients, if there is no contraindication for uh, DBB4 metformin and SGL2 inhibitor, it is a good choice to add on top of insulin. They reduce insulin resistance and they achieve, we can achieve better control of, of uh, hyperglycemia with minimal dose of insulin, particularly patients using steroids. Of course, you have to, before surgery, you have to stop all oral hypoglycemic agents, but I mean, if the patient is stable in the ward, I mean, not in the ICU, or it is good uh, you know, option to add oral hypoglycemic agents on top of insulin to reduce the total daily dose of insulin and you achieve better glycemic control with less hypoglycemia. This is my practice. Okay. Yeah, which is the big thing with hypoglycemia. Yeah. Huh? And that's the value of traveling and attending conferences and presenting papers. Uh, I used to think that I'm the, the Ibn Batuta, traveling once or twice a month, and then I discovered that I'm Juma, just the same. Okay, we did, did MRI the uh, following day, and you can see that the pressure is off. Still, of course, there is still some dua thickened, but we have achieved the uh, core decompression. Dramatic improvement, but still, he did not have a normal gait, but he improved a lot. And this is his discharge summary, and this is the one year follow up. Still, some thickened the dura, but no core compression. He actually went to Germany to, to work there as an IT. Two years follow up again. The syrinx did not disappear. You don't expect syrinx to disappear. And that's what I tell my patients. And four years follow up. And five years follow up. Now we're asking him to stand in one foot each time to make sure that his knowledge has improved. So in conclusion, we presented a case, a rather rare case, but it's important to differentiate, which is the hypertrophic back meningitis. And we alluded to the IgGG4-related disease, 
So increased awareness of this disease will result in early diagnosis and treatment. And I must stress this, pathologists should have highest index of suspicion. When I send the specimen to the pathologist, I just trust him. He may come back to me and say, this is granuloma or this is syphilis or whatever. I have to trust what he says. So uh, Dr. Farsakh had highest index of suspicion and he diagnosed as well. And this is the general plan. If you have a tumefactive lesion in more than one organ, so it is multisystemic, you do laboratory uh, tests, you see it's in a field, etc. You do imaging. And then if you have an IgG for specific studies, you continue, you do the frozen, or you take the tumor out and send it for histology and you confirm the diagnosis. Uh, I really thank you very much for coming tonight and the floor is open for discussion. Any questions? My comments that if DG can help you in follow-up, it will not help you in diagnosis, but it can help you. My question for Dr. Marsak, what I remember that from a lecture which I attended one day, that the result of histopathology is not just important in the diagnosis, but they told us that it is important in choosing your line of treatment. Is that true? No, there is not such thing I mean, in this disease entity. It is, yeah, we don't differentiate between these things. But in diagnosis, yes, it's very important to diagnose it and to diagnose it right. And really, we have criteria. And if these cases, they are overlap. You are, they don't collect all the uh, inclusions criteria. Like in, uh, if you have different inclusions criteria, I think you have to treat them as such. Two out of three, as we said. Yes. Any question, any comment? If none, I thank you. Please, Dr. I want to ask if, uh, as far as the patients, as you mentioned, they respond to steroid dramatically. Is there any trials done comparing steroids from the beginning? We as surgical treatment plus steroids. Yes. Or it is post factum just. You cannot diagnose from the beginning. Therefore, you are going for surgery. As I said, I've uh, looked into the literature extremely deep because we are writing it down for publication. And I found a few of these uh, slides or these uh, studies that if the patient has imminent cord compression, you have to go for surgery. You just cannot rely on steroids. So it is surgery followed by steroids. But if the patient does not have an imminent spinal cord compression, then you can start with the steroids and continue that. But most of the time, you need to go for surgery if that occurs. And they recur very often. I want to ask a question about the patient. How much he really improved? He's back time? absolutely to normal. Joint position since uh, power, sensation, sensor level disappeared. He is uh, mm -hmm. he's living normal life and he's working in Germany. I might have missed that. How long did he require steroids? Uh, he needed that for about six months, which is the recommendation, six months even to one and a half years. Is he still a diabetic? No. The video has disappeared after stoppage of steroids. Thank you again. We'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you.